Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Well, let's open up to the book of Acts chapter 2. We're going to learn how the Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. The church has been waiting for 10 days since Jesus uh, ascended into heaven. He had rose again, then he ascended after 40 days. And they've been praying and praising God together. They've been meeting constantly in the temple or in homes. And they've just been seeking after the Lord because Jesus told the church to wait for the gift, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And John says, I baptize you in water, but he who comes next will baptize you in fire. And he's talking about the, Jesus baptizing us in the Holy Spirit. Uh, this day is called Pentecost. It's why some Christians call themselves Pentecostal because they or we seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be powerful witness of, witnesses of the gospel. Um, we do have in Christian circles people that do not believe that this is for today any longer. We at some, uh, Calvary Sunday God or Calvary Church, we believe that Pentecost experience where the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes upon people, we believe that is for today. So we believe it continues and that God uses his church to be powerful witnesses in our community and around the world. So if you are learning about all this today, um, just buckle up and try to do my best to teach what I can and help apply it to our lives as well. We're going to be in Acts 2. They've been waiting and here's, here's, our, here's the moment we've been waiting for. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. And there was about 120 of them. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them just above their heads. And everyone was present, filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the next part is this. And began speaking in other languages or tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So let's pause there for a moment. Can you imagine being there in this moment? Wow, how exciting would that be? And probably a little intimidating or just like, whoa, what is happening? Um, but they were so consumed by the Holy Spirit, I don't think they were too worried about what's going on. I've been in prayer services, I've been in church services, I've been with pastors or the flock or the people of God, and we've been praying and the Holy Spirit fell upon the room, came into the room just like this, or in our prayer circle, or in our small group, and everyone began to pray in a different language or tongues that we did not know. And it, it sounded like a rushing wind, and you felt on fire, like you're burning for the Lord. You know, you're just ex excited and set on fire. And it's a powerful experience. And that's more spiritual. This was literally like there was wind, a divine supernatural experience from the Lord where wind just rushed into the house and it was loud as a mighty wind. And then they saw flaming tongues of fire, so to say, over their heads. And this literally happened in this moment. And then they began to be filled with the Holy Spirit and out of the overflow of that feeling, they began to pray and speak and praise God in tongues in a language they did not know. This happened. Just so you know, for those who argue this, you know, was wrong or, or not right or this isn't for today, this was authorized by Jesus himself. Jesus was telling them to wait for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. And how would you know that he showed up? You would need a dramatic event, right? Just like this one. So how would you know that he really filled you? Now, this event, it's the only time it happened like this, where there was a mighty wind and there was fire. But moving through the book of Acts, you'll see that the initial sign every time was they prayed in languages they did not know, okay? That is the initial primary piece of evidence that someone has been baptized in the Holy Spirit is they begin to pray or praise God in a language they did not know. Never once again in scripture did he, did he show up with wind and fire over people's heads or anything like that. 
That was what happened here in Acts 2. The rest of the signs were they would pray in an unknown language or in language they did not know. All right? What is the day of Pentecost? I think it's important we, we uh, tie the, and connect the dots here on this. Pentecost means the 50th day after Passover. 50 days after Jesus uh, died on the cross, rose again. This was a harvest festival among the Jews. It's also called the Feast of Weeks. It was seven weeks long. And uh, on the 50th, that's when Pentecost was. And it changed here. Now then it was they brought their offerings to the Lord. They brought the first fruits of their grain offering to the Lord. And they celebrated what was going to come in the end of the seven weeks. And so it was a very uh, it's a biblical Jewish tradition and Jewish teaching in the Old Testament. And now it's being done in the New Testament here. But the coming of the Holy Spirit comes on the Pentecost now. So it changes some things. What used to be a celebration or a mission to <clears throat> celebrate the harvest of real food and grain is now the harvest of many souls coming to Jesus Christ. Now the Bible says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest field is representing the world and all the people in the world who need Jesus, okay? You follow me on that? So here is the great harvest spiritually, the beginning, and I, spoiler alert, okay, on this day around 3,000 people give their life to Christ. It's the beginning of a spiritual harvest, the new kingdom, the new covenant working through the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's what Pentecost means to us as Christians so listen, when someone says, are you Pentecostal? Well, I believe in the Pentecost, especially Acts 2 Pentecost. I would practice that. I am a Christian, okay, first and foremost. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus who believes in the Pentecost. I don't necessarily need to put Pentecostal before my name, okay? Now, the Assemblies of God, we believe in Pentecost, so we are our Pentecostal distinction in our beliefs. We belong to the Assemblies of God fellowship of churches around the world and here in the States, and we believe in the Pentecostal experience. What do we mean by that? We believe in receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? To be witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our town and to the ends of the earth. That's why. That's what it means to be Pentecost, to be Pentecostal. Amen. So the imagery is powerful here. In the Old Testament, God showed up in the storm on Mount Sinai, the, the, the loud thunder and the clouds, and then fire. He showed up in the fiery bush to Moses. That's how we know this was God, because it was the same reminiscent uh, images of God in the Old Testament and his uh, encounters with people. Here he is once again showing up to the church in similar ways. They would understand that because they remember all the stories of God showing up to Moses and leading the people. The constant reoccurring sign in the book of Acts is the filling and baptism of, spirit, of the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, as I already said. So we may not experience wind in here. We may not experience fire in here. But what we may experience is hearing people pray and praise God in tongues. The scripture here says, fill with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues. What does that mean? So let's get into that. It's important that I answer this question for those who may not know this or haven't lived in a church that believes in these things. So speaking in tongues is a supernatural expression of God's spirit. It is a Holy Spirit inspired way of speaking, praying, or praising God by which a Christian speaks in a language they have never learned. When a person speaks in tongues, it may be an existing spoken human language, okay? It may be that you speak in a language that you don't know, but someone else knows, all right? And it's meant for a reason. We'll get into that. Or it may be a language unknown on earth. Paul says that it's the language of angels, 1 Corinthians 13, 1. You can read that there. An unknown language uh, of angels, so heavenly language. Now, speaking in tongues or speaking in tongues when you're being baptized in the Holy Spirit is not a, a human activity or will Okay, we don't do it ourselves. The Holy Spirit initiates this manifestation. The Holy Spirit works this in your praising and praying to God. 
How? Because you give your life in full submission to the Lord. You surrender yourself to him. He will begin to work in you and fill you, and you'll begin to pray. And here's what happens. When people are filled with the Holy Spirit, a lot of them say the same thing. They can hear or tell there's another language in their heart and in their mind, and so they declare it out with their mouth. So, it, yeah, I mean, will you, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be so overwhelmed of praising God and praying to him and giving him glory that what could come out next is a language you don't know that's praising him, that's praying for something maybe. And I'm gonna get more into that as we move forward, all right? But here's the thing. When we are worshiping God and we're fully submitted to him, we're gonna allow him to work through us, right? That's what it means. So it can happen even in this service where the Holy Spirit just works through us and fills us and what comes out is spirit-inspired speech, an expression of the Holy Spirit. The historical significance and purpose of this event is key, though. I want to make sure I focus on that as well before moving to our next portion of Scripture. This event marked a dividing line between the Holy Spirit coming upon people for occasions in the Old Testament, like David, the Holy Spirit came over him, or Samson, the Holy Spirit came over him, all right, there's moments in the Bible in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit came over God's people to do tasks. The New Testament, Acts 2, Pentecostal experience, is now the Holy Spirit lives in you and stays with you. That is a key historical moment. That is the significance of Pentecost, is that he doesn't just come upon you for a task and then he pulls away. Now he fills you and he stays with you. All right, that's key. We also know that just like Jesus The Holy Spirit came over him at his baptism, and then when he went to be tempted, he was full of the Holy Spirit. He came out of that full of the Holy Spirit. He resisted temptation. He never sinned. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. All right, so Jesus needed the Holy Spirit just like us. He lived a life just like us so he could sympathize, empathize with us, and go through what we go through and be able to identify with us. All right, so he too was um, covered and filled with the Holy Spirit so he could do ministry the church also should be filled with the Holy Spirit to continue to do ministry. And then lastly, and this one's also important too, the temple is where the presence of God dwelt as we look through historical, biblical texts and through the Bible, okay, through the Bible. We see that God dwelled in the tent with Moses in the temple. Okay, that's where his presence is. Now, we are his temple, that's key, okay? He, he comes into your life, and you are now the temple of God. You are now a dwelling place for the presence of God to live and move. That means you have the power and the presence and the personal relationship with God right now if you're a Christian. He is with you. He knows what you're going through. He cares about what you're going through. He knows, you know, everything about us, and he's right there. So call upon him, and he will be there for you. He's right there. It also comes with great respect. If we are the temple of God, we need to treat our temples right, and we also need to conduct ourselves right because we are the temple of God. It also means that we don't have to just have church here. We can be the church out there, right? We can be the church at Food Lions. We can be the church in our schools, in our colleges, in our workplaces. We bring the presence of God with us. Man, that's so cool. Thank the Lord. You can have church outside of this church building. All right, so you think that this is going to get people's attention? What do you think? A bunch of people praying in tongues. They heard wind, and there's maybe they didn't see the fire because it was inside the building. But, yeah, it definitely does. Let's go to verse 5. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. They were also there to celebrate the festival. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and they actually say, historians say Galileans had a little bit of a dialect in their speaking, all right? Um, And and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Now, I'm going to do my best to pronounce all these nations, okay? Let me get some water first. Okay, here we go. All right, here we are. Okay, this is the people. They've heard this going on. They're coming and going, what's going on? We are Parthians, Medes, Elamites, 
people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, uh, mm, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. Thanks, I did it, yes. <laughs> and we all, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> praise God. And so this is what they're, they're shocked by. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Stop right there for a moment. Could that be what we're praying in tongues is we're praying about the wonderful things God has done? I think when we're first filled with the Holy Spirit, that is for sure. I think when you're filled again and again, that is for sure. But you're going to hear in a moment that sometimes God speaks to the church, the gift of tongues, a particular message, not just praises. Okay? But here's why you don't have to be weirded out or freaked out about this. If you're praying in an, in an unknown language that you don't know, you're, you're most likely praying about the praises and the wonders and the goodness of God. Now, why would that happen? Now, you know right now in heaven, all the angels are worshiping God over and over again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, right? So if we're in the presence of God like these angels are, aren't we going to do the same thing? If we're in the presence of God, aren't we also going to be just praising him? Because here's the thing, when I've been filled with the Holy Spirit and, and have an encounter like that with God, I can't help because I feel so much peace and so much joy, I can't help but give God praise and glory. It's like, it's like your spirit and God's spirit come together and you're in fellowship and you're going to do exactly what you'll do in heaven. You're going to worship and praise God. It's a little taste of heaven on earth. That's what it is. So I think that's what's going on. Well, we know that's what's going on here, but I believe a lot of times when people are praying in language they don't know, it's the same thing. But it also can get very specific in certain situations. But these, these people are all there for this festival. And I know I'm, I'm, getting, I'm going backwards a little bit, but let me just say this real quick. I think it's important. They're all here for this festival, this Jewish custom to practice this and to celebrate the grain harvest and I think it's not by accident. I believe God intended for this to happen. Because they have come from all the places they've been dispersed or where, they, where they've converted to Judaism. And the Bible says that the gospel will be preached to the Jews first and then the Gentiles, which means everyone else that's not a Jew. And so God is the greatest evangelist in the world. Knowing that all these people have come in, million at least a million people have come in to celebrate. Some live there and some don't. They've come to celebrate this festival. What better way to get the gospel out than in this moment right here? They're here for a short time. They're, they're talking about the wonders of God. Spoiler alert, Peter preaches a powerful message under the help of the Holy Spirit next. And 3,000 people get saved. We're going to get to that next week. Okay. So God starts a harvest of souls and evangelizes around 3,000 people or more because of families right here on the day of Pentecost, who wouldn't want to believe and be a Pentecostal Christian? That's awesome. I want to see God move like that in this church and around our state and our nation. Amen. Praise the Lord. So God planned this all along. This was his plan was to show up on this day. And they're, they're like wondering, what could this mean? And let's go to verse 13. Okay, verse 12, it finishes, they, they stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. That's an important question. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they're just drunk, that's all. It must have been weird to hear that, you know. It must have been interesting. Can I just, as a pastor, can I just encourage something? Um, well, I'm going to do it anyway, so, okay. It's already on my heart. Uh, sometimes in Christian circles, when we get baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit and we have an experience like this, we sometimes say that someone's just drunk in the Spirit. Like, they're so overwhelmed in the Spirit, they're drunk in the Spirit. And I get what you're trying to say. I don't like it. I don't like it because... God doesn't agree with drunkenness. So not, I don't want to tie that word to it. I think they're overwhelmed and overflowing with the Holy Spirit. All right? And there's, there shouldn't be a drunkenness tied to this. 
I think that is outsiders looking at that saying, and they were antagonistic about it. They weren't, they weren't, they were actually criticizing and mocking them saying, you're just drunk. All right. So I disagree with that. So as Christians, can we not say when someone's filled the spirit and we're walking around them, can we not say they're drunk in the spirit? Is that okay? Sound good? All right. I appreciate that. (laughs) Okay. Here we go. Let's keep going. Verse 14. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd. I love this. Peter takes the moment to disciple, okay, and he has to explain some things because they, they're wondering what could it mean. They heard, they heard the praises of God in their language, but they didn't know why this was happening. And when someone doesn't know why it's happening, they, they could actually mock Christians for that because they don't get it. You know, you know, we do that, right? When we don't understand something, we can bash it without understanding it, right? And a lot of people do that about people who believe in the Pentecost and, the, and this experience. They bash people who have these experiences, but they don't understand what's actually going on. And so Peter is about to jump into what we call an apologia. It's the Greek word for defense or explanation of something. And it's where we get our word apologetics, defending the faith or explaining our faith. So he jumps into apologia here and he gives a defense for what's going on. Verse 14, then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. (laughs) Yeah, Amen. (laughs) Or any drunkenness, right? No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. Oh, man, this is so good. Okay, so just keep in mind, this is Peter who was hiding because Jesus was being persecuted and then was crucified. He's hiding. He denies Jesus three times. He's rough around the edges out of all the apostles and disciples. He's the one that's a little rough. You don't know what he's going to do. Jesus reinstates him, you know, essentially forgives him and says, get back to work in John 21. And Peter's no longer afraid because Jesus rose again, but also because the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you to give you courage. And he's, he's preaching this message out of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's bold in this. He says, no, and, he, and he, by the way, he brings in scripture from the Old Testament. What a good pastor, Right. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. And here's what Joel said. In the last days, God says, I will pour, my, pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Let me stop for a moment real quick. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. You know what that is? That's generations of people. Sorry, generations of people that are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why we believe this continues today. Because your sons and daughters will also experience this, not just you guys. In those days, I'll pour out my spirit even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. How cool is that? And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red. Before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives, but everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In the last days is the context here. So when Jesus was born, some people believe that was the beginning of the last days because it was prophecy being fulfilled from the Old Testament. We also can, moving forward, we can say when Jesus ascended, the last days began. So we've been in the last days for over 2,000 years. We're not sure how long it's going to be and it's going to take, okay? And Peter doesn't try to put a time on when it's actually going to happen when Jesus returns. What he says is, in the last days, the Lord pour out his spirit upon all people. Is that happening? Yes. So we're living in the last days. And he will pour out his spirit on all people, okay? Men and women, uh, both genders, doesn't matter the age, it doesn't matter your class. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, your, your uh, length in the family of God. He pours out his spirit on all people, for all people, 
to be filled and prophesy and to do ministry for the Lord. Isn't that good news? It's not just for one group of people or certain people. It is for all people. And they will prophesy. What does that mean? The word prophecy in the Bible means to be a mouthpiece for the Lord. To be a mouth for God. So in this room on Sunday mornings, especially in this service and in the last service, we've had people speak out publicly a prophecy or to speak for the Lord. Okay, you've heard that from our brother or sisters in Christ in this room. That is to speak for the Lord, a message from God through our mouths. You understand? Okay. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit and they prophesy. Now that is a fearful and very um, reverent thing to do. We don't do that jokingly. It's not a joke. Okay. We don't play around with that. Uh, we shouldn't mock it. And you know what? As the church, we shouldn't speak out unless God has given us a prophetic word for the church. Okay? With that said, it takes courage to do that. And it takes obedience to do that. Now, last week, the Lord was filling me up and speaking to me. And as I'm praying in the spirit, and when I say that, I mean I'm praying in tongues up here at the altar, and I'm worshiping God, I'm praising God. The Lord showed me and kept putting on my heart that someone was struggling with suicide. I came up at the end of the worship service and said that out of faith. Now, some could say, well, Ryan, there's a lot of people here. The chances of that are pretty high because despair is very, really bad in our world. You're right. But it was dominating my heart and mind. I couldn't get out of my head. That's how I knew it was from the Lord. I got nervous in my stomach, and I was like, uh-oh, I have to do this, don't I? The Lord's like, yep. Now, as a pastor, he knows I have the mic. And so I just got to trust the Lord. That's what he wants me to do. I came up, and I said, there's someone that came in here struggling with suicide, but that God wants to save you and change your life, and you don't need to do that. You don't need to take your life. You're a brand-new person. You're going to be okay. And sure enough, I'm getting texts and calls at the end of church last week, and a gentleman's in the lobby waiting for me, and he said, that was me. So God does that. Yeah. Now, you know how that's a sign that God cares about every person in this room. I didn't wake up going, all right, I'm going to... I'm going to create a, a word that's about someone who's dealing with suicide and all that. It wasn't even on my mind. A lot of times before I come up here, I'm just praying that we're ready to receive the word, that we're encountering God now. Sometimes I'm a little nervous about it. So I'm asking God to calm me down, you know, to help me not be nervous. And I'm doing all that. But instead, as I'm praying in the spirit, God is, is giving me the burden to keep someone from killing themselves. Okay, God cares about what you're going through right now in this room. He could give a word for someone, particularly specific for someone in need, because he cares that all people will be saved. And he doesn't want you to have death. He wants to have life and life abundantly. So praise the Lord for that. God is good. All right. So with that said, that's what it means to prophesy. It means to speak out in English. All right, to speak out in a language we would understand a word that the Lord has put on your heart. But you need to do it fearfully and carefully and make sure it's not just something you're burdened with that's not meant for everyone. Okay, and the Lord will lead and guide you to do it. And we as a church need to be gracious and test that and pray about that. And it should be biblical. It shouldn't be man-made. Okay, it should match what scripture would say. Understand? All right, cool. I'm, I'm lost on my notes, but it's okay. The Spirit's leading me here. Uh, let's see. They will see visions and dream dreams. This is interesting. They can mean the same thing, okay? Someone could be dreaming and they have a vision. Someone could be awake and they'll have a vision, all right? We're hearing both. Um, in the Assemblies of God Fellowship, we have so many missionaries, and they're telling us in nations around the world, that Jesus is showing up to people in dreams or while they're awake. 
And all they can think of is it's Jesus. But it, they say it looks like an angel or it looks like Jesus. And, and the vision or the person is calling them to believe in Jesus. Okay? Is telling them that he loves them and be ready. You know, these things are happening. And in the last days, he will pour out his spirit and young men and women, old men and, and old women will have dreams and visions. For what reason? To help us do the work of ministry. Okay? Not to be like, I had a dream and vision. I'm cool. No, there's always a purpose behind it. I've had dreams where God has given me a specific situation and then it happened a week later or two months later and I asked the Lord to help me understand it but most of the time, I just wait for it to take place. If it was from God, then it will take place. If it was from my um, Mexican food I had the night before, it, it was that. Yeah, it was... The spicy, the spice. I had too much jalapenos or something. I don't know. I was watching too many movies that day. Who knows? And so what do I do is I just let the Lord, I, I let the Lord give it to me again if it's from him. I ask him to have someone come to me to confirm it. I've had dreams that have come exactly what I saw in my dream. For what reason? To help me be ready for what was going to come, come next. All right, so these, these are key things. It, and it's also meant to... It's also meant to, of course, help people come to Christ. And then verses 19 through 20, he's looking further down the road in end times. Let's, let me remind you what it said. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. However, we are seeing some of that right now. There's some crazy stuff happening in our world right now with nature, with weather, an increase of things. All right. Blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord and his arrival. So some of that has not happened yet. What Peter isn't, he's not focusing on when that happens. What he's focused on here is, and what the prophet's saying is, that the, the Holy Spirit will be poured out all the way up until Jesus comes back. So some of these signs are going to be taking place, and the Holy Spirit could still be being poured out on people. All right? So I agree with that interpretation. Some might have different perspectives of that. In verse 21, the message of the church, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Because those days won't be good. They'll be treacherous. They'll be hard. In the last days, things get harder. But everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. To do that, it means you have faith. It may not mean that you had 20 years of faith. It might be that God opened your eyes in one day and you're like, the pastor preached that in Dover, Delaware on October 1st, call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And so I'm doing it right now because I see that Jesus is coming back. There's signs everywhere, all that, you know, so that could be what takes place. And that's okay. God knows your heart. Amen. Let's, let's apply this to our lives. Okay. To, uh, to today, which all of it really can apply to today. But first of all, I don't want us to miss the mission of Pentecost, the mission of Acts 2, the mission of the church. We should embrace Pentecost, but not forget its purpose. The purpose of this baptism in the Holy Spirit is to equip the believer with the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be an effective witness of the gospel. That's it. That is the first purpose of this, okay? The purpose of Pentecost wasn't to speak in tongues. That was the outflow or the overflow of the Holy Spirit showing up. That's why it was the last thing that took place in the list of things that happened that day. So too often, I've heard Christians say, have you spoken tongues yet? Have you spoken tongues yet? I cringe when I hear that. Because it's not about speaking in tongues. It's about being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? What we're really trying to say and what we need to adjust our saying is, have you been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit yet? Do you want to even be filled? Do you even know the reason for it? That's what I start. Do you understand the theology, the study of it? Why are, do we, this is why I've been taking my time, the first two chapters. Why would we tell you to speak in tongues? We don't even know why. 
Because it's not about that. Speaking in tongues is what happens when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a, a product of the Holy Spirit being in you and overflowing out of you. Okay? That's the key. So I wouldn't want to focus. I, wouldn't, I don't want to put the cart before the horse. Okay? You, what you want to do is you want to seek more of God. Seek the gift, the promise of the Father. And say, Lord, fill me. I need you. I want to be a witness for you, but I'm going to need your help. I want to be whole and pure and do your will. I want to do what your word says. I want to obey your commands and go make disciples, but I'm going to need your help. Isn't that cool, though? Think about that for a second. You're saying you can't do that on human power. You need supernatural power. You're saying you need God. You don't just need yourself. You need God. It's a dependence on the Lord to be baptized and filled with the Spirit and even receive fresh fillings. And it's because you're saying yes to the mission of the gospel, of being witnesses of the gospel. We, we understand that? Okay, cool. The power is that the Holy Spirit will be with you, and when you're sharing the gospel or you're, you're caring for someone, he will give you the ability to pray for a healing and someone's healed. Or like what happened to me last week, God gave me a sign to help this gentleman know God hears him and he doesn't need to live in despair to give his life to God. Okay, we prayed together out in the, in the lobby too. All right? So God will use you. But here's another thing. The Holy Spirit will use your life and your words, especially about the gospel, to convince people to believe. So do the signs. If that gentleman came in last week and wasn't sure if God's real, he does now. And he said it. He said it. Convincement. <laughs> the Holy, and I'm, I made that word up, I think. I don't know. It might be a real word. But the Holy Spirit works alongside you as you're sharing your faith to convince people. All right. Let me go further. We're going to wrap up here soon. Speaking in tongues occurs in personal and corporate settings. I really need to cover this because I think people get confused on some things. All right. Again, we all know that someone prays in tongues because they're being filled with the Holy Spirit, Right? We don't make that up. We're not babbling random words together. That's not true. That's not being fully, it's not being truly filled with the Holy Spirit. That's man making that up, okay? Um, typically, when someone is first baptized in the Holy Spirit or when someone's receiving fresh feelings, they will pray in tongues. And when someone is filled with the Spirit for the first time, it is usually never for the congregation to receive a word that needs to be interpreted. In other words, it's their private prayer life to God. They could be at the altar. They could be in a prayer meeting. They could be in church in the pew. And they're praying in tongues. And you can hear them, all right? That doesn't mean it's a word for the whole church. That's the corporate gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues that's needed. Now, that happens, and that's the corporate setting. The corporate experience is someone in the church, not everyone has this gift. Not everyone has the gift of tongues and interpreting tongues, okay? Someone in this, we have people in this room right now who have the gift of speaking in tongues for the edification of the church, which means out loud, they could give us a word in tongue and then there needs to be an interpretation of that so we understand it. Otherwise, we shouldn't give it. So when someone gives, and now here's the thing, a lot of times we step out in faith to do that. So when someone gives a word in tongue, we all as a church should pray, God, interpret it for us because we don't understand. And you would be right. None of us understand. However, in Acts 2, they understood it. See, it was a miracle. They heard their languages. Now, sometimes it's a heavenly language and none of us understand it and we need an interpretation. Hence, the gift of interpreting tongues. Now, this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is Paul, who loved Jesus. So this isn't some outer biblical text of stuff. This is from the Bible. This is from Jesus. So someone will give a word in tongue, and then someone interprets it so that we can be edified, all right, so that we can be built up and we can learn what was said. Everyone follow me on that? Okay, almost done. Thirdly, speaking in tongues is not only a gift for the church, but also a sign to unbelievers. We already learned that a little bit here that in Acts 2, they were unbelievers. 
They heard the wonders of God being said in their language. How can that be? They're Galileans. They're all speaking different languages. How is that possible? Did they have, you know, Duolingo back then? Did they, did they have some kind of app and they download it real quick? No, of course not. This is a miracle. A miracle to get the attention of unbelievers to be a sign that God is real and to believe. And so someone in this church could have a word in tongues interpreted and someone in this church could be an unbeliever and go, whoa, I was just praying about that. Like, because you know unbelievers still talk to God, right? And it's interesting to me. And they might be going, God, if you're real, show up right now. You'll give me an answer to this. And then someone may speak a word and be interpreted, and it's exactly what they asked. Do you think that's a sign? Yes, it is. Or we've heard many stories in the AG circles where people are hearing their native tongue, and they're in a different place of the world. For instance, let me give you an example. I've heard so many stories, I can't keep up, but let me give you an example hypothetically. A church in Asia a German person is there, they're sitting behind a person who speaks in tongues, and they're like, that's not in tongues, that's my language, but for everyone else, they didn't understand it. That person needed to hear that and gave their life to Jesus Christ. That's a sign for unbelievers. So we want people to pray in tongues and be interpreted and fulfilled, because one, it builds up the church, because God will encourage us, warn us, correct us, love us, teach us something, in that, but it also could be a sign to unbelievers, all right, to get their attention, just like it did in Acts 2. And they're like, what does this mean? And guess what Peter did? He was a good pastor, and he explained it. Cool? Why don't we stand together for the last one? Let's stand together to close. Thank you for hanging out a little longer. This was a lot, but I wanted to stay on track and put this all into context. Let's review. How is a believer filled with the Holy Spirit? Notice I said believer. Believers are filled with the Holy Spirit. So you already have the Holy Spirit in you because of salvation, and now a greater filling of the Spirit and power comes into your life. We need to understand this, that the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person, not an it. He's not a Star Wars force either. He's a person. He's a presence. He's personal. I would say, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, make sure you have a relationship with God. Make sure you have a relationship with God. Yeah. And then hang out with God. Fellowship with him. When I say fellowship with God moving forward, just so you know, It means to be in the word, reading the Bible, praying, talking to him. You fellowship with people. I fellowship with God. We all do that, right? Have fellowship time with God. Tarry or linger with God. They waited for 10 days. Sometimes we got to wait and just wait for the Lord. And you know what they were doing too while they did that? They were praising God. We did that in all of our songs. We were thanking God. So while you're worshiping during church or even before I preach, you could be getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And the evidence of that would be you'll be praying in a language you don't even know. And you know what? I don't want anyone in this room to be scared about it around you. I think we need to welcome the experience in the presence of the Holy Spirit, right? We need to welcome that. And then lastly, this needs to be said. Um, Check your motive. Make sure it's not to get the badge that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and now you speak in tongues. That wasn't their purpose. You know why they were there when this happened in Acts 2? They were there because they wanted to serve God. They loved him. They wanted to obey. The Bible says, if you love me, you will obey me. They obeyed Jesus. They went to Jerusalem and they waited and they gave their lives. We sang that in the third song, to give our lives as as a sacrifice, to give over our lives to God. Church, give your life to be used by God. It's the greatest act of worship we have. And when you do that, when you're ready to serve him, he's going to be like, well, your heart's ready. I need to give you the power to help you do it because you won't be alone. My spirit will be with you. Isn't that cool? So pursue God, wait on him, ask him for the gift of the Holy Spirit to fill you. And now you know that your experience 
will include praying in a beautiful, unknown language to you. And um, so I pray that that happens for your life. And I pray you see the realness of it, the authenticity of it. Um, we're, not, we're not weirdos here. We just want God. And we want what God's word says we can have. So I hate to even put that word in your mind when it comes to this. Because now it makes you think that. But this is real. This is something Jesus said to be filled with the Holy Spirit. For power to be witnesses, that's the key. So let's pray, let's pray. And Wednesday night, we have our prayer night. We're gonna spend extra time just seeking the Lord for this, all right? Because there's so many people that need Jesus and we need his power and help to do it. Lord, we thank you for today. I thank you for this, this church who's gracious enough to hang out a little longer. Lord, thank you for our children's workers and our nursery workers. God bless them today. And Lord, I just pray, God, that, that this teaching would just stick to our hearts and our minds, Lord, that, Lord, it would change us from the inside out. God, that we would go after you this week, that, Lord, we would be a church filled with your Holy Spirit, a spirit-filled church on fire for you, chasing after your will, doing what you want to do, Lord. And we thank you, God, for whatever experience comes with it, God. We thank you for that. Be with our, our church body, guys. We go our separate ways. Bless them. Lord, use them powerfully this week, wherever they're going to be. I thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing in this church. And it's all because of you. It's all because of you, God. Let me give you the glory and praise. Lord, if there's anyone in this room right now who needs you, God, I pray you would speak to their hearts. If they need salvation, they would call upon you to save them. That, Lord, we would be a church that would come alongside them and help them understand how to follow you. And, Lord, for anyone who needs healings and miracles, Lord, and provision, God, God, I pray you would answer their prayers today. Thank you, God, for caring. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need further prayer, we'll have prayer team members up here. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.